the arrays activity. So this is a pretty big lecture. Uh, we're going to be introducing arrays and all of the kind of uh, associated ideas. So we're going to describe why we would actually use arrays. Uh, we should uh, be able to create arrays using uh, array literal syntax and also the array class if you really needed to. Uh, we should also be able to access specific elements in an array. We should be able to add an element to the beginning or the end of an array and also remove from the beginning and end of an array. And we'll also explore adding and removing elements to or from anywhere in an array. We'll also iterate over all of the elements in an array, copy over all or some of an array, and create a single string from an array. So as you can see, quite a few things that we're going to be doing in this lecture today. Uh, we are going to start in with our setup. You're going to notice that our setup is going to be a little bit uh, less and less uh, kind of verbose as we're going through the week. Uh, so we're kind of uh, taking the uh, guardrails off a little bit uh, and uh, going to kind of rely on built knowledge that we have uh, at this point. So uh, what you're going to want to do is just like always make sure you are in your lectures directory so i'm going to go back home real quick and to get into my lectures directory i'm going to cd into code and then sei and then lectures once i'm here i'll have my js control flow directory you all will also have your js concepts directory as well and we're going to make a new directory here called JS Arrays. So to do that, we're going to do mkdir js dash arrays. And then we're going to move into that directory again using your tab autocomplete. You'll see now that if we do our JS at the start, we'll have a couple of different options available to us. Just use that tab selection to select the correct one. In this case, we want JS arrays. And we are going to go ahead and create a uh, JavaScript file and an index.html. So we're going to touch an app.js and index.html. You'll see now if I do an ls, I now have an app.js file and an index.html file. And now I can go ahead and open this up in VS Code with CodeSpace. Everybody with me so far? Anyone need me to go back and catch anybody up? Uh, could you do that one more time? Yeah, so you can kind of see the flow that we went through here. Um, we started out in our home directory. So CD back home. We moved into code, SEI, lectures. And then once we were in there, we created that JS arrays directory and then moved into that directory. So you'll see there's that directory right there, JS I got it now. Thank you. Perfect. And then once we're in there, we touch our two files that we're going to be using in this lecture. Once we did that, we opened everything in VS Code. Again, those instructions are uh, over here in the actual calendar event for uh, this arrays lecture. So you can always refer back over there if uh, you missed a step or anything like that. All right, cool. So uh, after we've got that, open this in VS Code. We should see our two files that we just created, app.js and index.html inside of the JS arrays directory.
Now that we've all got that, we're going to open that index.html file. And as you can see, we've taken off that first guardrail. Here, we're adding HTML boilerplate. That's all we're saying. So who remembers how we add boilerplate? Exclamation point. Yes, you've all got it. Perfect. Exclamation yeah. point tab. <laughs> So again, as we're going through this, kind of internalize the steps that we're taking to make things happen, because we're going to start taking off guardrails like this as we move through time. Eventually, kind of by the end of this unit, you know, we'll be like, hey, go create a JavaScript file and an HTML file and link them up to one another, because we kind of expect you to be picking this stuff up as we move through time. Again, if we have stumbles along the way to get there, that's totally fine. No big deal. All right. So now that we've got our boilerplate, we're going to link up our script. Of course, as always, we're going to defer this script. And the source for it is going to be within the same directory that we're in. So we add that dot slash app.js. As always, we can do our little sanity check here. I'm going to console log out a quick sanity check. Let's go live. I have so many ports open at this point. <laughs> and there is our sanity check. Everybody good, everybody to this point. Yeah. Say that one more time, sorry. Still trying to get there. Cool. All right. So with our uh, live server running after this point, what we're going to do is create an array consisting of your, th your favorite movies. So how do we create an array? Well, I'm going to make a const called movies. I'm going to set that equal to an array, and that is this square bracket. So in here, you have this opening and closing square bracket. This is an empty array. And inside of this, we can add in elements. And in this case, this is going to be an array of movies. They're just going to be strings. That's it. So I'm going to add in three movies here. All right, so I've got my three movies in strings. You'll see that these are comma separated. And there's three movies. All right, and that means that we're ready to start this lecture. So what are arrays and why do we need them? Well, arrays are actually objects in JavaScript. Uh, they happen to, that is simply the data type that they are. They're a special type of object though. Uh, they're going to have uh, kind of keys, which we'll talk about whenever we talk about arrays or uh, objects on Friday, uh, keys of one, uh, zero, one, two, so on and so forth. 
So it's a special type of object. Arrays can contain uh, zero or more items. So you'll recall whenever we first started out, we have no items in here. This is an empty array. So this is an array. It just happens to be empty. And this can have more items in it. However many we want to have in here. And these are going to be called elements, each one of these individually. The string arrival is an element. The string parasite is an element. This string alien is an element. Whenever we get into HTML elements next week, make sure you don't confuse them with that. If you refer to this as something like an item in an array, everyone alive is going to know what you're talking about. So if you know your uh, language is off a little bit here, we're still going to get your uh, kind of basic idea that you're trying to get across. All of our elements can have any data type. This is something a little unique to JavaScript. Um, so for example, I could come in here if I really, really wanted to for some reason. This is not something you will ever really do very often, but I could do, um, let's make an array and I could have a number, I could have a string, I could have a uh, Boolean, I could have null, I could have an object. I could do all of this within any single array. Now, again, as I said, there's really no reason to do this. Uh, you can, it is possible. Um, but for our purposes, what we're going to want is to keep arrays uniform. We're generally, generally going to want all of our elements to have the same data type within a single array. You'd see that that's what we've done here with our movies array. All of these are strings. And that's so we can iterate through these movies and make sure that we can do the same activities on all of them. So we can say, this is an array of strings. So I'm able to iterate through this array and uh, do something to each one of these strings. Whereas if I have something like this, since these are all different data types in here, I'm not really going to be able to be consistent with what I can do to the items in this array. So we want to keep these generally all the same item even or the same data type, even if JavaScript allows you to get away with not doing that. Now, Arrays are special in that they are ordered. So whenever we go through an array of any kind, these items are going to be considered to always be sequential. If we do something with this, then these items will print out in an order, for example. You'll see that whenever we get into what are called uh, array iterator methods. Uh, we'll probably dabble a little bit in that week, this week, but we'll mostly start talking about those next week. And because an array will have multiple items in it, even if you initialize it as an empty array, you're always going to want to call this plurally. So for example, this is movies, not movie. Because what we're expecting is there to be multiple movies in this array. So therefore we name them plurally. So why do we actually need arrays? Why are these important? Why do they matter? Our 
arrays are going to be what we use to actually hold lists of data. Think about uh, users on, uh, say, something like, um, heck, I don't know. Uh, let's say, like, Facebook. What we what Facebook would deal with, for example, is if we had an array of users, is each user here is going to be an object, like we'll talk about tomorrow in a little bit more depth. But each user is going to have something like a first name. And also a last name. This is obviously overly simplified of the data that like Facebook would have, but just as an example here, this is kind of what this would look like. So I would have then, uh, let's say, uh, Ben. And if I wanted Facebook to have more users, I could do Jurgen, Stevens, so on and so forth, right? This is kind of uh, where we're eventually going to go with arrays, is having arrays of objects. And this will be what we deal with through most of the course. So as you can see, this array is holding on to this list of data that we have inside of here. And again, we'll get to a point where we're using this more, but we're today we're going to start pretty simple. We'll just be dealing with things like strings. But just so you know, this is ultimately kind of the place that we're going to go with this. And that's why arrays are so important to us. And think about if we didn't have an array as a data structure, what we would have to do is Facebook would have to store their users as something like, Let's, user one is equal to an object that is this. And we'd have to go and write all of this stuff out over and over and over. And this doesn't give us a lot of, uh, a lot of ability to have kind of some dynamic programming that is happening here. This is clearly all just us going through and being static with how we're programming this out. We don't want to have to do stuff like this, which is why we have arrays. Because eventually, by uh, in a little bit here, what we're going to be able to do is grab uh, certain things out of an array and also add and remove items from arrays as well. Whereas we can't really do that same thing with variables, or at least it would be extremely hard. So therefore, we use arrays. So that's the what and the why. Let's actually, we've kind of already created an array here. Um, another way to create an array, I'm not even going to write this out. You're not going to see it or use it very often at all. Um, occasionally, there are purposes for it. I'm not going to kind of dive into that here. Uh, but another way to do something like what we've done here will be something like Uh, let's say class movies. And this would be something like new array. And then we pass in all of our movies into this. This is something we haven't really covered yet called a class constructor. 
We'll talk more about that next week. But this is another way to create an array. For our situation, though, again, very, very rarely going to do this. Most of the time, what we want to be doing is this up here, because this is a little bit more concise. Uh, and also, its behavior is consistent, which is really kind of what matters to us. Whether I have no items in this, whether I have one item in this, or whether I have three items in this, its behavior is going to create an array using the data that I provided. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, does it matter um, whether or not you declare the uh, variable of the array as let or const? Good question. So here, what this will do is by having const here, I am unable to go and say something like movies equals uh, taco. This is going to be invalid code. We're going to have uh, invalid assignment to const movies. This makes sure that this is always going to be an array. Now, what this does allow me to do, though, is change what is inside of that array. All that JavaScript is going to care about is that, hey, this is an array. So you'll see as we move through this that I am going to be able to still modify this array. I'm going to be able to remove things from it. I'm going to be able to add things to it. I'm going to be able to move items around inside of it just fine. But it, this movies here is always going to be an array. Great question. Cool. So I've got my movies array all set up. And now what I can do is I want to access the first item of this array. Let me go ahead. Let's throw a console log in here just so we can see kind of what's going on. Let's log movies. And we will expect to see, hey, look, there's an array and it has three items in it. Cool. Something you'll notice here is that how this is logged out. Here, we have the zero. And the value for this is arrival. Then we have one. And the value for it is parasite. And we have two, and the value for it is alien. Remember how I said an array is kind of just a special kind of object where the keys are numbered. That's exactly what you're seeing here. Here, this key is numbered, and it has a value. That key has a corresponding value that number. So you'll see here something interesting. This starts with the number zero. There's a lot of history here of why uh, our arrays start at zero. Um, you'll see that there's a little uh, kind of call out here talking about why this is, and it has to do with essentially uh, kind of the history of how these different items, how an array is stored in memory in the computer itself. This is something we'll hit much more on whenever we get to computer science stuff in Unit 4. But let's go ahead and say I want to access the first item in this array. We do that with this special syntax. Movies square bracket, and then the index of the item that I want to access. Well, what is an index? Well, an index is simply the name for a key in an array. So that is that index corresponds to the position of the item in the array. For example, arrival as is at index zero. 
Parasite is at index one, and Alien is at index two. So by having movies and then square bracket zero here, I'm accessing the zero index, the item held in the zero index, which is arrival. If I switch this to the number one, we'll see that I log out parasite item in the one index. If I log out two movies, square bracket two, we're going to see alien, the item held in the two index. Any questions about that? Uh, yes, Mike. So with um, the the arrays are just like keep going uh, basically infinitely until you go to a new one. So, you know, 20, 30, et cetera. But it 100%. always starts at zero. Yep. So I could have uh, this just repeat on and on and on forever and ever. I'm just going to duplicate this uh, set of movies a few times just to kind of prove this, but this could keep going for a very, very long time. Okay, but yeah, so it always starts at zero, though. It always starts at zero, and now this array has 294 <laughs> items in it. <laughs> so I can access, let's look at and see what item, let's see what 255 is. It's arrival. So whatever I want to access a item in this array, I can use this kind of syntax. Okay. Is it often that we get uh, uh, large arrays like this or? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I kind of hesitate to show you this, but hey, why not? We'll go on an adventure. Um, let's look at the Pokemon, Pokemon API, right? So Pokemon, if you are not aware, there's lots of Pokemon. There's there's many of them. Uh, and this API uh, allows you to look up, uh, let's see, all of those Pokemon. So for example, this array that we get back here could potentially have up to 1,154 items in it. This would be something that uh, would that this would be something that you would uh, potentially see in a large uh, set of data, right? Um, you could have much, much more than this as well. You could keep going and going and going. Again, think of like users on Facebook. Um, there would be a lot of items in that array. Um, you would probably not even want to get to that large of a data set that you would access from within a browser, but that is kind of an example of like, hey, arrays can be very, very large. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Oscar. So is that how they, like, for example, like on, like on, on apps, like on, like Instagram, for example, right? Is that how they generate, like when you look, or you're already saying yes, so... Is that how they generate lists of, of users when like if you want to go to somebody's follower account and then it's just like it you get an a create you get the list of everybody on there. Is that how they do it to arrays? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So like a friends list would be like an array of friends that are associated with a given account. That's all of that would be held in an array. Okay. Cool. All right, so. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. Perfect. So we've accessed an individual item in an array. Um, you'll see now if we just to kind of display what this looks like. Where did my there we go? You'll see if we access something that isn't here. Remember before I was accessing this whenever there were 200 and something items in here. Now there's only three items here. And whenever I try to access the 255th element. What I'm getting back is undefined. That's because this position in this array doesn't have anything associated with it. So it's undefined. 
So just side note, while we're here, if you try to access something in this array that doesn't exist, that's what you're going to see. Undefined. All right, so. Um, let's go ahead. Let's talk about adding an element to an array. Uh, keep this, but have it be zero. Perfect. All right, so let's add in a new element. To do that, we can add to the beginning and to the end of an array with two different methods. To add elements to the end of an array, we're going to use the push method. To add them to the beginning of an array, we add the uh, unshift method. So let's talk about this. If I do movies.push, this is typically the behavior that you're going to see. We're going to add to the end of an array, typically. Not always, uh, but most of the time you'll be pushing to an array in this course whenever you're adding elements to it. And what this does will add whatever I put in this parentheses to the movie's array. So say I want to add in Star Wars. After this, what we're going to see, if I do a console log of movies, Our array now has four items in it. Arrival, Parasite, Alien, and Star Wars. You'll see Star Wars is added to the end. Say I do movies.unshift to add something to the beginning of an array. Uh, movie, movie, movie. Jurassic Park. If I unshift into the movies array and then log movies. You'll see that Jurassic Park was added to the beginning of this array. Push, add something to the end, unshift to the uh, beginning. And also use similar methods to remove items from the beginning and the end of an array. So for example, I can do movies.pop to remove the last item from an array. If I console log movies again, you'll see Star Wars is now no longer included in this array. It's been removed because of movies.pop. If I do movies.shift, this will remove an item from the beginning of an array. And you'll see that Jurassic Park is now no longer included in this array after I've shifted it out. So these methods here, push, unshift, pop, and shift, will help you add and remove items from an array. Now, a lot of people kind of struggle, including myself, struggle with remembering specifically shift and unshift uh, and push and pop and when to use one and when to use the other one and all of that. Um, so there's a great way that you can remember this. So adding is going to be those methods, let's say methods for adding have more letters. You'll see push, push has four letters. And it unshift has uh, seven letters in it. 
whereas methods for removing have fewer letters. Pop has three letters and shift has five. So this is one helpful way that helps people remember which is for uh, what action. Whenever you're adding, that has more letters than whenever you're removing. The other way that you can uh, remember this is both of these that start with a P are going to uh, add or remove from the end, whereas your other ones are for the beginning. So just some devices to kind of help you remember what does what. Uh, Aya. Are there ever any times when you're going to put um, anything in the parentheses of pop or shift? Uh, let's look that up. So if I look up pop on MDN, what we're going to see is the syntax for this is always just going to be pop with this empty or uh, empty parentheses. So this is how we're always going to write this. You'll never have anything that goes into this. Whereas something like, let's look up uh, push on MDN. Push, we could see has a different syntax. We can push in element zero, we can push in element one. We can continue this, so on, so forth, for as many elements that we want to add into the array. So this syntax here in MDN is really valuable to kind of quickly determine, hey, what is this going to look like whenever I'm using it? Whenever we have push here, these are the elements that we want to push into the array. Whenever we're using something like pop, it is always going to have just this simple open and closing parentheses syntax. Great question. Uh, Will, yes. Yeah, I noticed, you know, with the, the with the uh, shift and everything like that, and shift, push, um, you know, adds to the beginning and the end. What happens if you want to add something, like, in, in the middle of the array? Yes, we will get there. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Oscar. Uh, can you use, so now that we've gone over this, can you use this? Or is this how they, like, for example, if you're playing a game and the, the whoever's in first place, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on and so on changes, is this like, is this a way to do that depending on, I don't know, whatever criteria you set that will decide what place? You could do that. Um, probably not, but you could. It's possible. That, that would be one way. We'll probably what I would do for that is actually in, uh, I would probably do that inside of an object, I think. Um, but you could do it in that way if you wanted to. Depends on the, the application. Um, something like, for example, say you had like Mario Kart, that would probably be held inside of an object, I would assume. Uh, we'll cover more stuff like that whenever we get to that point. Um, let's see. So from here, uh, we talked about da, 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 all of this. Perfect. All right. So how do we, um, back to, uh, Will's question, how do we add stuff, uh, to the middle of an array? How do we adjust things in that way? So. Right now, I have Arrival, Parasite, and Alien, and that is my array. So I swing back over to my browser. We confirm that. There we go. Arrival, Parasite, and Alien. So again, just as a note, 
at this point, this is what we've got. Uh, something I kind of want you to note as I'm going through this is notice how I am console logging all of the time. I have as many console logs as I have other lines of code. This is what you should be doing as you're writing this stuff out so that you can understand what the computer's doing. If you just go through and do this and you're like, yeah, I'm holding in my head, what is happening through all of this? And I, you know, I am able to like keep all of this straight in my mind, like that's fine. But while you're trying to learn this stuff, being able to know what the computer is doing at any given point of time is invaluable. Um, so don't be afraid of taking these baby steps, like write along a line of code and then immediately write a console log right after it just to see what you've done. How has this line of code changed this array? Being able to go through and visualize that is really, really handy um, and will absolutely help you as you're uh, starting out with this stuff. Also, don't be afraid of doing stuff like this also, where you're writing out specifically like movies is this. Don't be afraid of doing stuff like that while you're learning. That helps you kind of provide context for a program in your mind as you're going through and building this stuff out. So don't be afraid of, you know, taking a step back and evaluating where you're at at any given point in time. All right, so uh, from this, uh, let's go ahead and add in some stuff here. So to add and remove an element uh, from or to anywhere in an array, we can use what is called the splice method. And we could see that the short description of this on MDN, the splice method is going to change the contents of an array by removing or replacing existing elements and slash or adding new elements in place. And that also gives you a fun little hint that you might find helpful to access part of an array without modifying it, see slice. For your entire life as a developer, you will always mix up splice and slice. That is just how it is. Get used to it. You're always going to look that up. That's why documentation is super handy. But what we're going to learn first is splice. And what splice is going to do, you'll see here that this has a number of parameters. And we can see the syntax here for this. So we start our splice with the start. This is the index at which we want to start changing the array. So where do I want to start changing this array? We can also optionally specify how many elements from that position we would like to remove from the array. That's this delete count. So we can specify the start and the delete. We can also optionally provide items that we would like to add to an array beginning from the start position. Splice is your first big like foray into having to kind of digest and understand what is happening inside of this MDN documentation. But until now, we've kind of like touched on this and said like, oh yes, this does this. Uh, whereas our splice uh, method is going to be a little bit more complicated and we're going to be able to make certain decisions based off of this. So 
let's go ahead and kind of look at uh, some potential options that we have with this. Uh, I'm going to add a couple of, um, let's make sure that we have a few movies available to us. I'm going to go ahead and push in a couple more movies here. Uh, so I'm going to do movies.push. Uh, let's add in uh, Interstellar. And also Iron Man. So now after this point, movies is going to be this right here. Interstellar is the third index item of this array and Iron Man is the fourth. So this is my array. It has five total items in it. And you can see Arrival is on our zero index, Parasite at the one index, Alien at the two index, so on, so forth. Cool. So what I'm going to do is let's start with movies.splice. And what I want to do from this location, looking back on our documentation, I want to start at this three index. I want to start here. So that is going to be my start location. Three. I want to, uh, my ultimate goal here is to remove Interstellar and Iron Man and replace it with another movie. So I want to start here at Inter Interstellar. And I'm going to, again, to accomplish my goal, I want to remove Interstellar and Iron Man. My delete count, the number of elements I want to remove from the start position here is going to be two. So this... Right now, if I log out movies, what I've done here is I've started at the third index and I've removed two of these movies, Interstellar and Iron Man. Swing back over here, we can see that that is what is getting logged here on line 42. So I've removed those two movies. And what I can do, again, optionally with Splice, I can add in elements to this array beginning from the start position. So I could add in, uh, let's say, everything, everywhere, all at once. And now... I swing back over here, we'll see that I've, in addition to removing those two movies, I've added another movie. And I could put this at any location I want. Say I want to remove Parasite and Alien. Then instead of starting at the three index, I could start at the one index. Now what I've done is remove Parasite and Alien. I've replaced it with everything everywhere all at once in the middle of this array. So my new array is Arrival, everything everywhere all at once, Interstellar, and Iron Man. Uh, Alex, question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to see how you did movies is as a note underneath that you linked them up with like their integers or did you just tab it out or is there like yeah. an easy to copy and paste that? No, you just tab nope. I just, yeah, yeah. Just space it and uh, do it that way. Okay. It's super manual, but it works. 
All right, so. Again, this is kind of how splice is going to work. Um, another thing that we can do here is actually look at what we've removed from the array. So you'll see here, this splice method returns something out of it. We'll talk more about this tomorrow whenever we talk about functions. But what we can grab from movies.splice is actually an array containing the deleted elements. So remember here, we're deleting two movies. In this case, that will be Parasite and Alien. And what we can actually get from movies.splice are those two movies that we've removed if we wanted to have those for some reason. So we can do const removed movies equals movies.splice. And now if I log this, what we'll see here is going to be Parasite and Alien. Let me throw in a little comment here. Here we can see these are our removed movies. So again, because movies.splice returns the items that we remove from the array, in this case, again, we're starting at the one index and we're removing two items. So we're removing Parasite and Alien. And because movies.splice returns out of it an array containing everything that we removed, we put that into a new variable called removed movies, and then we're logging that here. Again, we'll get more into returns and what that means tomorrow, uh, whenever we talk about functions a little bit more. But for now, this is kind of knowing what uh, comes out of Splice uh, is helpful for us. Uh, yeah, Kayana. Um, yeah, I know you said we're going to talk about it more, but is there a reason why it doesn't uh, give any mention of everything everywhere all at once, even though it's a part of um, the condition? Great question. So that is simply how um, this is set up. So we can see that uh, whenever we're using Splice, and this is this is where our documentation really, really comes in handy, the return value here is an array containing the deleted elements. That is simply what it is. That is what we get out of Splice. So this is something that we don't have any control over. This is simply how this method is written. And whenever we use it, this is what is always going to be returned out of Splice, is an array containing whatever we deleted out of it. And since everything everywhere all at once is something that we added into this array, uh, not something that we removed from it, that is why we don't see that here as part of the removed movies. Good question. Um, any other questions about this so far? Uh, again, just to demonstrate this, say I don't remove anything at all from this array. So I'm starting at the one index, I'm not removing anything, and I'm adding this item here. What we'll see if we come back to this is that my first, my removed movies array is entirely empty. There's no items inside of it. Because again, I didn't delete anything from that array. So I've just got an empty array here. And you'll see that everything everywhere all at once was added here, right where we told it to be. We're saying, hey, 
start at that one index, don't remove anything, add this. So again, this is one of those points where our documentation is invaluable to us. And we can see here that because we have specified this delete count as zero or negative, then no elements are removed. So super handy for us. All right, continuing on from here, let's go ahead and take a break. Um, how about we come back? I'll give you, uh, let's do 13 minutes. I'll come back at 10 after. We'll pick up from there. Do some stretches.
All right, everybody, come on back. Uh, Driven, you've got a question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if this is um, relevant at this point, but I was just trying to implement the splice method that we were just talking about for the lab. And I was able to do exercise five successfully, but as soon as I went to exercise six by replacing the food item pizza with a sushi and cupcake, it changed my array for exercise five as well. When Ooh, I went interesting. Um, that's something we can hit on maybe tomorrow in lab review, potentially. Okay. Deal. We haven't really gotten into that yet, but whenever we assign labs the next day, we'll have a, um, we'll have like lab review going on. So, uh, that's, uh, kind of whenever we can kind of talk more specifically about like whatever lab we assigned to y'all. So. Uh, Jeremy. Um, so I was wondering if you could re-explain the splice method. So I was trying to play around with it, but it wasn't, I wasn't able to comprehend. Um, in regards to the numbers, I know the that we're adding to the array, but then what are those numbers again? Yeah, absolutely. So um what we're doing here again, like the, the the documentation is really like your uh, kind of best friend as you're working with this stuff, because uh, it will describe kind of these things uh, to you in a little bit uh, more detail. So this first number here is the starting index for whatever action that we're going to take on this uh, movies array. So we're coming in we're saying hey take me to the one index take me here to parasite and our second number here is saying hey i don't want to remove anything that's what we're saying by zero say we want to remove something say i want to remove parasite i could put one here say i want to remove both parasite and alien i could put two say i want to remove parasite alien and interstellar well then i could put three so this is saying start here and remove three items parasite alien interstellar and then our final item here is saying what should we add in starting at this one location and we'll see here whenever i swing back over to our page what we've done is we've removed Parasite, Alien, and Interstellar. Those are the items that we've removed. The number of removed movies is three. And we've added in, as you can see up here with this console log, everything, everywhere, all at once. So our new array after this splice is Arrival, everything, everywhere, all at once, and Iron Man. That help you out? Yes. Yeah, so the um, it's deleting everything after that index that we um, communicated at first. Exactly. The things after this location. So say I change this to two. Now what we're going to remove are three items from that position and uh, onward. So we're doing Alien, Interstellar, and Iron Man. And you can see that that is what is being removed from here. All right. So, uh, Isabella, yes. So let's say you had multiple items you needed to remove. Let's say one starting at item zero and then the other one starting at item three. Can you combine uh -huh. those? in this line of code? You would not be able to combine that in this one thing, uh, unless you wanted to remove, say, everything from item zero all the way to like item three. Uh, you could do something like that here, 
but say you wanted to remove Arrival and Parasite, but then you wanted to remove Interstellar, that would require two separate lines of code to be able to accomplish that. So what that would look like is something like this, where we've uh, spliced out Arrival and Parasite, replaced it, and then we have uh, Alien and Interstellar. And what that would look like, say we want to remove Interstellar, here is uh, let's do movies dot splice and interstellar at that point would have a starting uh, index of two and we just want to remove one item from there so what that would let's kind of dissect this a little bit so movies after this point uh, we've removed arrival and parasite We've added this in. Uh, so what this would look like is this. We've got our zero index, our one index, our two index, and then three for Iron Man. So Uh, let's shorten this up a little bit just for fun so we can get this all in one line. All right. That's a little bit better. Yeah. I like that. Okay, cool. So now what we have here, say I want to again, remove interstellar then, and I'm not going to add anything here. I'm going to remove interstellar from this. And that is exactly what we can see here. Perfect, thank you. Of course. Uh, Diana. Hey, so I, I may have missed this. So I have up here, um, just movies splice one two and then the two movies so i'm just um why are we doing remove movies like uh we... yeah so remove movies here is going to be what is returned out of movies dot splice so we kind of hit on this a little bit here um, the return value. And again, we'll talk more about what a return is tomorrow. Uh, but this return value is what we get as the result of this. So we're able to set that equal to something. In this example, that is going to be removed movies. Okay. So we're saying removed movies is equal to whatever the result of this is. And with this splice method, the result of this is an array containing the deleted elements. So that's what removed movies will be. So do we, we have to do that? You do not have to do that. And we can actually see that here on line 45, where we're just doing movies.splice. Uh, this is something that we can optionally get out of this if we want. But we don't have to take that if we don't want the removed movies for holding on to for later for example okay so like best practices um not even necessarily like best practices but say like for some reason if i want to store these <clears throat> removed movies for some reason uh then that gives me access to them okay, okay later on okay cool perfect uh cody so even though you're pulling um the return and putting it into the const removed movies you're still actually modifying the original movies array exactly yes so what is happening here is that we are we're still taking this action we're still doing that splice so we're looking at index zero and we're still removing these two movies. 
Arrival and Parasite. And then we're replacing it. We're adding in this next movie, everything. So that is what is going to go in this location. So we can see here that with our movies.splice, this action still takes place. But what we get out of this, what this returns, and what we can uh, create a variable with is our remove movies. Cool. Thank you. Of course. Hi, Ben. Yes. Hi. I have an observation uh, and something that may help clarify this for people. Um, think of this as a deck of cards, right? Instead of an array of movies, think of it as you've got an array and each array is a different card. Like we're going to play a card game, right? You shuffle the cards, some function shuffles your array, right? So you've got random order of cards. If you want to take the top two cards off of the deck and do something with them, this would be an example of how you do that. This is applicable for your applications that you're going to be building in games, right? Because we're doing that for a unit one project. So if you had an array of cards that you shuffled somewhere and you had shuffled cards, if you did shuffled cards dot splice or let removed cards or picked cards equals shuffled cards dot splice, you could take any number of cards out of that, store them in a variable, remove them from the original array. It's called mutating the original array. And now you've got different things to do things with. You've got your cards that are still shuffled, but you've taken the two top cards off of, or however many cards off of, and you have your other cards that you're able to do something with. That'd be an applicable demonstration of how this would be useful in your projects. 100%. Cool. Uh, Diana, do you have a question or is your hand up just from before? Cool. All right. So that is Splice. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is actually iterate through uh, the elements of an array. And we'll see a couple of different examples of this. Uh, but what we want to kind of start with is going to be our for each loop. And this is going to be another uh, method that exists on an array. Just like we have splice, shift, uh, push, pop, all of those just methods that exist on an array. We also have access to another one called for each. So if I do movies dot for each, and here, we're actually going to have a function. And again, we'll touch more on functions tomorrow. So kind of just take this on faith. But for now, here, if I write this function keyword, there's going to be a function here. And I can grab onto the individual movie that we're looking at at any given point in time as we iterate through the movie's array. So what we could see here that I can then console log this movie just to see what it is. Let's start there. I'm going to actually comment out what we've done so far just so that it's super clear what's going on here. Uh, I do need some movies, though. We'll start with uh, this. So I have three movies. Let's just move this on down here. So I have Arrival, Parasite, and Alien. And we can see here that with this for each loop, I am console logging each movie. What this is saying is that for each movie in the movies array, take this action. This is very similar to our for loop that we talked about earlier, 
except for not having to say, hey, start here and go to here. Instead, on an array, the array knows how long it is. The array knows it starts at a zero index and it ends at this two index. And we're going to say, hey, for each item that we have here, go ahead and print that out. So for example here, let's take a quick look at this. So uh, let's go ahead and comment this out. So here on the first iteration, movie is going to be arrival. So that is the first step of this loop. And that's why our console log here is printing out arrival. We're starting at the beginning of this array. Remember our arrays are ordered. So whenever we do this for each loop, the first time through it, movie is arrival. On our second iteration through this, on the second iteration, the movie is going to be Parasite. And then finally, on the third iteration, the movie is going to be Alien. So our for each loop knows that we start at the beginning of this array and we move consecutively through it. We've got arrival, parasite on the second iteration, and alien on the third iteration. And then our for each loop knows that there's nothing after alien, so the loop ends. So this is a really simple for each loop that we've constructed here. Uh, Aya. So I've noticed that we didn't have to identify movie itself, even though it's different from movies. So when I tried to replace it with VHS, for example, it didn't work. So does it automatically populate and recognize it as a plural or singular? Because we never defined it. Very great. I love that you're calling that out. So you, you have VHS here, right? So our problem here is that we're declaring this variable here. And what we have to do is then use this. So now we could call this whatever we want, but we have to be consistent throughout this entire function. Again, this is something we'll dig more into tomorrow whenever we talk about functions. But however we define this here, we have to call it that same thing throughout. So I can call this whatever I want as long as I'm consistent through this entire function. So here I'm calling this VHS. And as long as I'm console logging VHS, I'm going to see the same result over here. So that's the rest of, that's that way, the rest of the way through code, unless we manually change it then. So it kind of right. solidifies it right then and there. Okay. Exactly. As long as we're inside of these curly brackets, Right here, we have to call these two things the same thing. We can call it anything we want, but I will say it makes sense to call this movie because we're saying for each singular movie in the movies array, I want to do something with a given movie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kiana. Um, yeah, I'm just a little bit confused with the way that you're putting function. Like, I have a couple of questions about it. Do you put function every time you use for each? And is it like kind of stating that whatever's in the parentheses is a function? 
Yeah. So essentially what we are constructing here, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. This is what is called an anonymous callback function. So that's kind of a loaded term here, but essentially what that means is this function that we're writing here doesn't have a name. Um, so we're not defining, we're not giving this a name in any way. We're just saying, hey, what is here is a function. Uh, so normally whenever we write out functions, they'll have some kind of name attached to them so that we can call them something. But here we don't need to have that because what we're doing is saying, hey, for each one of the movies that are here, just run this function. It doesn't matter what it's called, for example. Uh, so that's kind of why we're not giving this a name in this instance. Um, as far as um, kind of the construction of this, uh, again, we'll get more into that tomorrow. Uh, but for now, just know that, hey, this parentheses here, uh, whatever we put inside of this, for example, movie, that is going to be one individual movie out of this movie's array. May I, David? Because absolutely, Jurgen. You guys absolutely have to read this like a sentence. Take these movies, and then for each movie, oh no, sorry, for each movie, I want to take that console and log each movie here. Just keep repeating that stuff over and over your head, and it will eventually become second nature. 100%. Thank you, David. Totally. All right. So um, here is kind of our initial idea of a for each. Now, we can also add in uh, the index as we move through uh, this loop. So for example here, I can add in an index. I'm going to call that IDX. And now what we get out of this, along with having access to each movie, as we iterate through the movies array, we now also have access to the index of that array, of that item in the array rather. So for example, say we do this kind of manual iteration and walk through one more time down here. So remember on the first iteration, the movie is going to be arrival. But also, IDX is going to be zero. On the second iteration, IDX is going to be one. And on the third iteration, IDX is going to be two. IDX here is just a shorthand for index. If it helps you to write it out, feel free to write the full index word, you will very, very frequently see this shortened down to IDX, which is kind of why we uh, use that here. You're almost always going to see the syntax, but if it helps you kind of understand what it is, feel free to write it out just like that. I'm going to stick with IDX though. Uh, let me go ahead and log this too. So. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's lock this by saying uh, the index is, and then let's do IDX, and let's give this a little bit more clarity too. 
movie is. And then we'll have movie. Let's swing back over to our browser. So the index is zero. The movie is Arrival. The index is one. The movie is Parasite. The index is two. The movie is Alien. So this is simply the syntax that we have available to us from a for each loop. Let's take a look at for each real quick. For each JavaScript. Let's actually Google it. For each JavaScript. Here, again, our top hit is going to be MDN. Let's see here that we have a few uh, syntax items in here that we can uh, take a look at. What we've done before is this function keyword and then element. But we can also do this right here, the function keyword, and then element again here, that is movie. This is the element in the array. We're calling that movie here. And then the index. And we can see here from our documentation in our callback function that we've kind of talked about already. The element here is the current element being processed in the array. We've seen this play out. The first iteration of the movie is either Arrival, Parasite, or Alien. And the index of the current element being processed by the array is what we'll have on IDX. Again, depending on our iteration, either 0, 1, or 2. So these are all components that kind of help us build out uh, functionality that we could execute within this for each loop. Again, you will recall that we did this before without specifying the index at all. It is more than possible to build this for each loop without taking any consideration whatsoever for what the index is. But if we want it, we have access to it. So we'll always be able to uh, have these items available to us as we're using a uh, for each method. Any questions about this? Any questions about kind of how our iteration is working? Anything that we've done here? Yes, Kevin. And the array would be comma the third item there, and that would return the name of the array, movies, or the full array, arrivals, parasite, aliens. That is going to be, let's find out. It's going to be the full array, though. Uh, so this will be, let's call this uh, movies array, just so we are have some clarity in here. And let's console log that movies array. So we'll see that for each time we iterate through this array, we see that movies array being printed out. And that is the entirety of the array itself. Okay. Uh, you will not use this very frequently. Okay, thanks. Cool. All right. Um, so. Next up, uh, yeah, Kayana. I I don't know if you already said this, but the, is there any way to skip past um the first um what's it called parameter and get to the index? Uh, good question. Uh, so. For this, no, you will always uh, have that. You will always have to have this first item here. Uh, you can't just skip that and skip right over to the index. But what you can do if that's the case is simply just not make use of it. Uh, so here you can see that movie has dimmed out. That means it's 
declared, but the value is never read. We're only using the index here now. So if we go back over to our browser, we can see the index is zero, one, two. So while you have to have it there, there's nothing saying that you have to use it just because it is there. If we didn't believe you, is there a way that you could show us that in documentation? Because I'm skeptical of most of the things you say, David. Um, I don't know why you would be skeptical of what I'm saying, Ben, but uh, for actually um, seeing that, I, I where are you going with this, Ben? I just wanted you to show them the parameter list on MDN. Oh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. So here we can see that this looks like this. If we want to have access to the index, we have to have the element here. If we want in access to the array, we have to have the element and the index here. So all of these things kind of build on just having the element. You always have to have that at the very least. Cool. All right. You can totally, so you can totally all trust everything David says. He's 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 good. He knows his shit. All right, uh, so next up, we have a for of loop. Uh, I'm not going to dive too much into this. This is something that you will kind of pretty rarely use. But another way to iterate through an array is a for of loop. And what that looks like is this. So for let movie of movies. And here we can do the exact same thing. I can do a console log here of movie. And I'm going to just for clarity, I'm going to out our for each loop. And we'll see here back in our browser, this looks really similar to our for each loop. So you might think, why in the world would I use this? I have a for each loop. Why have multiple ways of being able to do the same thing? Well, this for of loop does have one specific benefit to it. And that is that you can stop it. A for each loop is going to start and then it is not going to stop for any reason until you get to the end of an array. A for of loop as we've constructed here, though, can be stopped. And we can halt its process. We can stop partway through an array. So for example here, we can say if, let's say if movie, uh, if a movie is parasite. Then what I'm able to do is actually end this loop. So what we'll see here is that I can do what is called a break. So if movie equals parasite, and I can break. Oh, well. And now what we'll see back in my browser, because the movie Parasite is the second item here, all I get logged out to my console is arrival. So because we're evaluating this, again, we're inside of this uh, loop, we're sequentially evaluating this code, uh, our first movie, Arrival, does not match Parasite, so it gets logged. On the second iteration, movie is Parasite, so we say movie is Parasite, that's true, so we do what is called a break. This is a special keyword in JavaScript that is going to stop the execution of this for loop. It breaks out of the loop. Uh, as you can see in the lecture, there is another way of being able to write this. We have a, this shorthand syntax that we can actually do with a 
a single if, where this is all on the same line. This is a pretty cool thing that you can do, but again, if you're at a place where you're writing something like this, that is more than fine. But it is nice to, you know, be able to kind of do all of this on a single line if you want. Cool. So this is kind of one of the benefits of this for of loop and why you'd want to choose this. All right, so moving right along, let's go ahead and check out, Hello. let's go ahead and check out Slice. Uh, you'll recall earlier, whenever I intro Splice to you, you are always going to get those two mixed up. Truly not a big deal. That's what documentation exists for and why we have Google available to us. The slice method is for being able to uh, create a copy of the entirety of an array or part of an array. So for example, here, we've got our three movies once again, and I'm going to say, let the last to movies equal movies.slice. Now let's, let's take a quick look at our documentation and see what it says about slice. Again, something I want to reiterate here is how frequently I'm looking at documentation, how frequently I'm just writing stuff out here as I'm building this out how frequently I'm doing these console logs. Take these little baby steps. Go slow through this. It's going to be much better for you than trying to rush through stuff and get frustrated because you're not sure what's going on in the computer in any given moment. Don't be afraid of doing stuff like this while you're learning. Write stuff out in English so that you understand it. All right, so slice. Uh, kind of as we've talked about, slice method is going to return what is called a shallow copy. Uh, we'll kind of get into that, uh, not today, but another time. Uh, so that's going to make a shallow copy of a portion of array into a new array selected from the start to the end, the end not included or start and end, represent the index of items in that array. The original array will not be modified. So, slice. We can see here is our syntax. If I just do movies.slice here, let's see what happens. Let's log out last two movies. What you'll see here is if I just do movies.slice, this is a full copy of the movies array. Arrival, Parasite, and Alien. So this technically isn't really the last two movies. It is the entire movies array, uh, simply a copy of that, if I don't provide anything here. Once I do provide something here, that's where this will start to change a little bit. So this is the index at which we want to start extraction. So here I want the last two movies and I want that to start at one. And this is really all that I need because you'll see here that this gives me the last two movies. And why is that? Well, because our documentation over here says, remember, end is something optional. 
And what we can do if we read through here, what happens if I don't have the end? Uh, da, 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 da. The row based index, which we want to end extraction, extracts up to, but not including the end. Uh, da, 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 da. If the array link zero is used, ah, perfect. If end is omitted, then the array dot length is used, which in short means that we have caused all elements until the end to be extracted. You might read this and be like, what is array dot length? What is this thing that's here? Why do we keep talking about array dot length? This is a great example of when you can take this and gain more knowledge through additional Googling. If you're not sure what this documentation is saying, go find out or just try it yourself. This is saying array dot length. What, what is this array dot length? Well, the array that I'm dealing with is the movies array. So let's see what array dot length is. What is array dot length? That's going to be three. What's that? Well, how do we impact this? How, why, why is this three? How does that change? Let's experiment. If I add another item into this array, now the length of this array is four. Well, I'm starting to catch on to something here. So because this array now has four things in it, and the length here has increased as I added an item, I could probably deduce pretty well that the length of an array is how many items are in it. Let me go and let's say that I've done a little bit of Googling and I have found length. We have the length property of an array object represents the number of elements in that array. Cool. So my deduction was correct. However many items are in an array, that's what the length is going to be of that array. You'll use array.length a ton. But this is one of those instances where if you don't know what something is, just go read and learn more about it. If you're confused about what your documentation is saying, whenever it says array.length, go find out what that means. Again, little tiny baby steps to piece together a greater whole. All right, so. Uh, here, we can see I got the desired result that I actually wanted at the end of this. Uh, but I could be more specific here and go to the end of this array. That would be uh, four in this case now. In which case here is, uh, instead of the last two movies, I added a movie on here. This will be the last three movies. Another great example of make sure that your variable names make sense. I wouldn't want to call that last two movies because I have three movies in this. Uh, yeah, Alex. So when you use like the first, is it the parameter you set of one in slice? Um, it prints out parasite because that's like, um, it's linked to that. But if you put in like one comma one, it doesn't print out anything. So why is the second one not connected to its, um, God, I can't think of the, the word today. <laughs> Like why why doesn't this, this like you have to like put four in there? But there's not even a fourth integer, right? So that is because going back to our documentation here, uh, this is going to be the index at which we end the extraction, and it extracts up to but not including this number. So if we say, "Hey, I want to start at one and end at one." then what this is going to say is, hey, I want to start here, but also end there. 
because we're going up to, but not including this number. So we're saying, hey, I, I'm starting here, but then I'm copying out of here uh, to that same location. So there's nothing for us uh, to put into this. So if you want to add the last one, you have to add um, an index higher than what's there. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Because you, this you is going to go array. up. You do the length of the array as the last one. 100%. You could totally do that. So you could do movies.length. And now whatever the length is of this, that is where this is going to go. Parasite, alien, and aliens. If I add in another thing here. Um, Jurassic Park. I feel like that's spelled wrong. There we go. Uh, so this will continue going up until the end of this movie's array. Cool. Thanks. Of course. All right. So. Uh, another way that we can actually copy over the entirety of something. Remember, we could have done movies.slice just like this. And now uh, let's say that this is going to be all movies. Just for clarity here. So I say log all the movies. This is going to be all of the movies kind of already established this. If I just do movies.slice, this is going to make a copy of everything from here and put it into uh, all movies. So if I instead want to make a copy of all of these, I have another way of going about that. Let me go back to our last three here. Take Jurassic Park out. All right, so restored my original uh, intent here. Let's go ahead and say that I want to let movies copy. And for this, we're going to use what is called the uh, spread syntax. What spread does is say, take what is here, take what is held, or we're going to eventually use the movies array, take what is held in the movies array and just make a copy of it. To do that, this is that spread syntax. We do this dot, dot, dot movies. And now if we log our movies copy what we're going to find is that here is a copy of our movies array now something you're thinking is well if i want to make a copy of this why can't i just do let movies copy equal movies why do i need this special syntax and you'll see here initially this works just fine. Our movies copy has copied all of the items out of this array. But this is something that is called a shallow copy. We hit on this a little bit earlier whenever we talked about slice. And a shallow copy is whenever our item has the same references or points to the same values. What does that mean in practice? Well, whenever we have a shallow copy like this, say I change movies. Movie score bracket zero. Uh, instead of arrival, I would like this to be, uh, let's say, let's bring Jurassic Park back. Let's 
you'll see here that even though I've modified the movie's array, if I log the movie's copy, uh-oh, my movie's copy has changed as well. So even though, again, initially this looks like it would be fine. What's happening is that under the hood in JavaScript, whenever you're using this, whenever you're just saying that, hey, movies copy is going to be equal to movies. What is happening under the hood is that this movies copy is still tied to this original movies that we have here. That is why it is important for whenever we want to make an actual copy, we use that spread syntax that we're talking about. Now, movies and movies copy are separate arrays from one another. And I can modify the movies array without modifying the movie's copy array. So again, this is a kind of brain bendy concept that we've got going on here, but this is why this syntax is important. And if we need to make a copy of an array, this is how we go about doing that. So, uh, you can also use this, uh, just briefly, briefly touch on this. You can also use this to insert items uh, around uh, something. So, for example, say I wanted to, as I'm copying this, insert new things as well. So here, now my movies copy is everything that is in movies along with Spaceballs. Just like we see here. So I've copied that movies array and added in Spaceballs. All right. Uh, yeah, I am. So when you add a movie to that under your, your uh, spread, like you did with Spaceballs, does that only apply to the copy or does it apply to the original as well? Exactly. It will apply only to the copy. So you'll see here if I just log movies here, you'll see that movies is our original uh, four movies without Spaceballs added to it. That only okay. applies to the copy. Great question. All right. So to wrap us up on kind of our uh, new concepts that we're talking about for the first time today, we do have one last thing. We can join a, a, a set of um, a set of our uh, array elements together by using what is called the join method. So for example, all of these movies, I can join them together into a single string with movies.join. So for example, let movie string, uh, and that's going to be movies.join. And you'll see that after I do this, if I log out our movie string, what we're going to have here is a string of comma separated values. Let's look at join a little bit more. So again, on our array methods, we have join. And the join method, as we've implemented it here, is going to create and return a new string by concatenating all of the elements in an array. 
So another thing that you'll notice about this is that if I log movies after I go through and do movies.join, you'll see that as here, my console log on line 98, my original array is not modified as part of this. So what we get out of this movies.join method only modifies the return. So whenever we're setting movie string equal to movies.join, movie string is where you're going to see changes, not on the original movies variable. So one good thing of note there, whatever we do inside of movies.join here, that's going to be what is called the separator. The separator is going to specify the strings that separate each pair of elements of the array, as we can see right here in the docs. So for example, right now, these are simply separated by a comma. Say I want to join these together, but I want that to be a comma and a space. That's what that would look like. Now these are joined together. There is a comma and a space between each item. Say I want this to be a few of uh, these dashes. Now I have five dashes between each one of these and also a space on both sides of those dashes. So I don't want this to be an arrow looking thing. That works too. Whatever we put in here is how these will be joined together. Cool. And that is really the last brand new thing in here. Um, let's go ahead. Let me give you all a quick break. Uh, let's do eight minutes and then we'll come back and do this for loop and we'll wrap up. Now we'll do it all in one fell swoop. Uh, just as a fun note, you can also do individual lines like that as well, uh, anywhere on the line. You don't have to like highlight the whole line or anything like that. As long as you're on this line, you can do command forward slash, and it will come in out and come it back in that line. Uh, okay. Why are you not doing it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a con controller command forward slash. Uh, Command forward slash on Mac OS. Okay. What are you doing? There it goes. Thank you. Perfect. Cool. So here is my number array that I've constructed here. And we've kind of uh, alluded to this, but we're, it is possible for us to actually have a uh, item that we add to as we go through a for loop. And that's what we're going to be doing here. We're going to let sum equal zero. And what our for loop is going to do is evaluate these numbers and add it to whatever the existing sum is. So for example, we can do something like a for loop here. Notice this fun shortcut that we have available to us. We can do for and then select that right in here. For, and then we get all of this set up for us right out of the box. Again, these shortcuts are awesome. You should totally use them. And what we're going to do here is actually go ahead and access the individual items inside of this array and add that to the sum. 
So I'm going to get actually go ahead and write this from scratch just because this is like our second or third time seeing a for loop. Probably from here on out, I would uh, use those shortcuts though. That's what they're there for. But I'm going to say let IDX equal zero. So again, this is our uh, initializer that we have here. And then we have our condition that's going to be uh, our condition expression. So that is going to be while our index is less than something we've used before in this lecture, length. So while our index is less than the length of this array. So again, we're starting this at zero. So we'll have the zero index. And then just as a uh, kind of, uh, as we move through this, what we're going to be doing is incrementing the index each time through this loop. So the second time we go through this, IDX is going to be one. The second time through this, IDX is going to be two. So here, let's do that under. So numbers.length is going to be three. So while IDX is less than three, note how we don't have a three index, that doesn't exist. So while index is less than three, so zero, one, or two, we're going to increment index. We're going to set sum plus equals the numbers array square bracket IDX. Uh, I have a syntax issue here. Note here that I had a comma and I have some, uh, I have an issue with this it's saying I expected a semicolon whenever I hover over this. We'll see that there is an issue in our browser as well. Uncaught syntax error. We're missing a semicolon after for loop condition. All of these things are set up to help you troubleshoot. Errors are good things. You want to embrace them and let them happen because they're going to tell you exactly what you're doing wrong. All right, so we have our for loop here. And what we've done is set this sum. We've got this plus equals numbers square bracket IDX. Let's talk about what this is. This is the equivalent of saying sum equals sum plus numbers square bracket IDX. You recall that numbers square bracket IDX, this is going to be either zero, one, or two. So we could have this, we could have this, or we could have for square bracket two. These are our three possibilities. So if we have numbers square bracket zero, what does that represent in our numbers array? What is What number is this going to be? Uh, yeah, Patrick. Two. 
going to be two of you. Yeah, exactly. This will be two. Number score bracket one will be number four, three. That's right here. And then numbers square bracket two is going to be one. So this will be, just to spell this out more, our first iteration. The second iteration. Or the third iteration. Through this loop. Now, on the first iteration through this loop, sum is going to be zero, right? We're setting sum as zero up here on line 105. So on the first iteration through this, sum is zero. On the second iteration, Sum is going to be what? Mm, two. Two. Exactly. Perfect. On our third iteration. Five. Sum, it will be five. Exactly. Do we have a fourth iteration? Mm, yes. Yes. Six. Mm. Are we sure that we're going to have a fourth iteration? It has to be less than the numbers length. Uh, length is three. It has to be less than three. So it has to be only up to two. Exactly. Zero, zero one, and two. So no. Exactly. So on the third third iteration of this, sum is going to be five. And on that iteration, what we're going to be doing is sum, which is five, is equal, or rather, let's do sum is equal to the existing sum, which is five, plus what is numbers square bracket two. That's going to be one. So finally, at the end of our iteration, the final value of sum, if we console log it out here, this is going to be five plus one which is going to get us six. Oscar. I'm totally lost at how, at how we got to the sum. I guess. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So let's walk through this. We've, we've got this kind of spelled out already, but let's actually put that into our actual equation that we've built down here. So on the first iteration, sum will equal zero because we determined on the first iteration, sum will be zero. And then numbers idx as we've written it right here is going to be two so sum will equal zero plus two on the first iteration on our second iteration because Remember, just to emphasize this again, this sum plus equals numbers IDX is shorthand for the sum is equal to the existing sum plus numbers IDX. Again, we've determined on the first iteration, numbers IDX will be equal to numbers square bracket zero which evaluates to two.
So here, we're adding zero plus two. So after our first iteration, sum is going to be two. So that brings us to our second iteration. So after our second iteration, sum will equal two plus what we've got here, three. This is where we determined that sum is going to be equal to five. And then finally, sum will equal five plus one on the last iteration. Instead of on here, let's say after. The clearer language. So we finished our iteration here. So now we finish this and sum, as we've console logged it here, is six. Uh, Kayana. Um, when I first did it, I put the console log inside of the curly brackets underneath, and it gave me a different mm -hmm. answer. I understand why we have six, but why does it give a different answer when it's on the inside? So say I do this, console log sum, and this is what we should see. Now, this is going to differ dependent on where this console log is inside of this iteration. If it is after we've done sum plus equals number IDX, then this is going to be reflective of this calculation already being made. Up above here, though, say I do that right here, We see our before and after. So here, our sum, again, whenever on our first iteration, sum is zero, just exactly like we said. So before we made our addition, sum is zero. After we do our arithmetic here, sum is going to be equal to zero plus two. So we see that after we've made that calculation, it's two. Then on the second iteration, sum is two before we do our calculation. Then after we do our calculation, it's five, just like we said right here. On the third iteration, before we do our calculation, sum is five. After we do it, it's six. So even though we're in this loop, we're still reading sequentially. We're still reading this code from top to bottom. We're console logging some on line 117. We're changing some. So then whenever we console log again on line 122, this is going to be some reflected of our changes. Cool. Any questions about any of that? Last lingering thoughts. Yeah, Kyle. Um, just to like be more clear, um, with the console log at the bottom, because it's a loop and it goes through that um, whole process um, for the amount of times that it does, it console logs every time. And when it's outside of it, it does it once for whatever sum you're trying to get. Exactly. Yep. So our console log that we've got here on 126 is just running a single time because it's outside of this block of code. Okay. Uh, Mike. So for clarification, before the um, the sum is considered on the iteration and then afterwards is like after the iteration. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, Diana. Um, I, I have a syntax error and I just really can't figure out. So I can't even see the output of it. Oh, so let's I check it out. And share your screen. Cool. Uh, so this looks like we have um, an unexpected end of input at line 50. So what we've got here and what your uh, what VS Code is trying to tell you is uh, this red that you've got right here doesn't have a matching close. So what you need to do is um, this would actually make sense after uh, line 48. Uh, so on line 49, you could do a curly bracket right there. And now you'll see that this has changed color back to yellow, indicating that everything is good. You'll see. Yeah, I was copying it from like your text, and I never seen a, another curly bracket, even though I know that. You need another curly break. I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotta yeah. have it. Totally. I don't even know how to. How to... I got you. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, bu 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 this is basically kind of walking through everything that we have done here. Uh, these graphics are super helpful. Um, Hunter made these for us. So uh, I would refer back to these. This really just kind of goes through everything that we talked about here. Um, so yeah, super useful here. All right, let's go ahead, do a quick set of review questions. I'll intro your lab and uh, we can get out of here for today. So uh, review questions. So we have four questions here. Uh, and the first one is going to be, what will the value of the variable color be? Thank you, whoever did that. Uh, so I have a value uh, or I have a variable here, color, just trying to figure out what that is going to be after uh, this code executes. Uh, Patrick K. It's going to be uh, green. It is going to be green. Exactly. Good job. All right. What is the best method to use to iterate through an entire array? Oscar. I cannot hear you. Sorry, forgot to take off my mute. You're cool. Um. You can console log the variable dot length to okay. How how would we iterate through an array? What would be the best way to go from like the beginning of an array to the end of an array and log everything out? Kind of like you're saying. Uh hmm. I don't think I know how to how to explain that. Okay, cool. We've had a few different things that we've looked at. We've had like our for loop. Uh, we talked about kind of this for of loop. Uh, we talked about for each. We have we have kind of uh, quite a few different ways of being able to like iterate through an array. And the one well, uh, that you're yeah. going to want to fall back on most is going to be. Uh, well, I mean, we we use we were using for each earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. for each loop is going to be kind of our best approach that we have for iterating through an entire array from beginning to end. Okay. Perfect. All right. So next question. What is the best method that we can use whenever we want to remove a single element from the end of an array? Talk about this at the beginning of the day. One. It's in a pop. It's going to be pop. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Nice. 
All right. And then finally, what method is going to be used to copy a number of elements into a new array? So this will be something that we specify the number of elements that we want to copy over. Lauren. Can we slice? Exactly. Slice. Yes. Perfect. Good job, everybody. All right. So um, that's going to wrap up our arrays lecture, uh, which will move us into your first actual lab activity that you're going to have. So this is uh, you're going to be your JS arrays lab. Uh, you'll note here on our calendar that this is going to be due two days from uh, today, uh, first thing in the morning before the start of class. So this uh, JS Arrays Lab, whenever you have that uh, finished up, what you're going to do is submit that over in Clippy. We'll uh, get that set up and uh, show you kind of how that will look uh, here in one moment. Um, so this uh, JS Arrays Lab has all of the instructions for uh, setting this up. So part one of this is going to be ensure that you're signed into github.com and navigate to the actual repository that you're going to be uh, working with. Uh, let me, I believe I've got maybe. this yes perfect so um you're going to navigate to uh this repository here and once you're in this what you're going to do is fork this uh this lab uh, Mariah, yes. Um, when I clicked on the link to um, where it says this repository, um, I tried doing it earlier, but it just says 404, the web page you're looking for is not found. Um, If that is the case, and I think a couple of you might have that issue, um, let me swing over to GitHub. Make sure you all have access to this. So. believe um da, 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 da. so we have a few people that still have invites pending i don't think this is you Mar though mariah uh so carlos uh justin and k um you all will need to swing over to what i am sending over in the classroom channel right now And then there should be a little link at the top of that page that will allow you to accept the invite. Again, that is just the three of you. Not everyone needs to do that. Uh, so Carlos, Justin, Kay, uh, you'll want to follow that link that I sent over in Classroom and accept that invite. Mariah, why would you not have access to this? Uh, da, 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 da. What's your uh, username, Mariah, for GitHub? Um, prime, P-R-I-M-E. There we go. You should have access to this. Interesting. Uh, are you signed in on github.com? Uh, yes. Yes. Interesting. We might have to get with you after this to, uh, troubleshoot that potentially. Okay. Um, I think I might have it because I just, um, whenever I clicked on the link that you sent through Slack, um, mm -hmm. I just signed in through there. So I'm hoping maybe I will be able to find it. Okay. Not, I will let you know. Perfect. Sounds great. All right. Uh, so let's swing back. Uh, once you have um, opened up that repo, uh, what you're going to want to do is click on uh, fork in the top right of this page. Uh, we, 
very, very briefly talked about uh, forking a repository uh, on Monday. Uh, so what this is doing essentially, whenever you click on fork, what this is going to do is, uh, as GitHub tells you here, a fork is a copy of a repository. Forking a repository allows you to freely experiment with changes without affecting the original project. That is what fork is, what forking is in a uh, kind of very brief way. And we'll see here that uh, whenever I'm creating a new fork, what I want to uh, make sure on this page that I have selected is my own user account. And then the repository name that I want to have here is this js-arrays-lab. So realistically, I should be able to come to this page and not have to make any changes. Uh, yes, Ryan. Um, I just tried to clone the, um, the exercise into my terminal, and mm -hmm. it didn't work for some reason. You have already forked it? And you're trying to clone your own copy of this? Yes, into my terminal. Okay, cool. Uh, give me one sec. We'll catch up with you. Sure. All right. So this, uh, realistically, again, you shouldn't have to change anything here. Uh, and you can click on Create Fork. And what you should see is your username up here, slash JS Arrays Lab. And that will be forked from SEI remote slash JS arrays lab. That's what this should look like. So once you're on this page, you'll want to click on this green code button as shown here, green code button, and click on this copy you have here. After you've done that, you'll want to swing over into your labs directory. So I'm going to go to my uh, user home, my user root directory, and let's go into our code directory slash SEI slash labs. You'll see here that I'm in my labs directory. And then this is where we can actually clone down this repository with git clone and pasting in the uh, address that we're cloning from. And then should hit enter. And you'll see that we have a JS arrays lab. Did that solve your problem, Ryan, or are you still having issues? Um, I mean, I did exactly um, what you just uh, done, but I it gave me this um, this error message. Cool. For Let me see your screen. Sure. Let's see if I can. Oh, interesting. Um. Cool. Try one more time for me. Just hit the up arrow and hit enter. Weird. I don't there know you go. This time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You might well, have just like had a temporary internet issue or something like that. Temporary connection issue to GitHub, but probably. All right. That's cool. Thank you. Of course. Any other issues so far? Juan, I see your hand up. I want to share your screen. Yeah. Let me see. Let me get in this error. Ah, uh, you need to do git space clone and then uh, another space and then paste in the URL. Git space and clone, C L O N E. Another space and then hit paste. Okay, there you go. Nice. Cool. Any other issues for anybody? Very good. All right. So, oh, uh, yeah, Oscar. Um, I kind of try to go ahead and 
and do it. And I got to the point where I, I got the, I got everything set up on Visual Studio. Uh-huh. Uh, but then when I when I pull up, uh, wait, where is it? From the Chrome. When I pull up the console, it, there's like there's like a one of the there's like something that's not defined. I don't know if that's something that we're supposed to fix or if. Yeah, we'll good. We'll get there. Okay. Cool. Uh, so after you have the lab on your machine, after you've cloned this down, you'll want to CD into the JS Arrays lab uh, directory, and let's go ahead and create an index.html. And then we're going to open this in VS Code. So we'll see a couple of things in here. We've got the app.js and our index.html. App.js has a bunch of stuff inside of it. Index.html, however, needs to have our boilerplate. So we'll add that in. And we're also going to add in our script. And we're going to defer. And the source is as it's been uh, always so far, dot slash app.js. And now whenever we go live, We're going to see that all of the ports are taken on my machine. <laughs> and uh, we will have this so far here. And we'll see that uh, through this, we have a reference error. Fave food is not defined. Uh, and this is going to be normal. Uh, this is totally fine. Uh, this is how this is going to be until you complete these different exercises. Uh, you might have errors like this. Uh, once we talk about functions tomorrow, and we get into building out functions, we'll be able to avoid errors like this. But unfortunately, uh, we have not talked about functions yet, so we can't um, contain these errors. Uh, so therefore they kind of bleed out a little bit. Um, again, this is totally fine. As you go through the lab, these errors will go away. As long as your error is always after where you're currently working, you should be fine. Here are our errors and until line 43. So uh, to actually solve these issues, and solve our exercises we've got in here. We're going to go through and uh, do each one of these tasks. Exercise one has been completed for you. We're defining an empty array that is named foods. That looks exactly like this. Foods as an empty array. Also see our console log here. This is where we are logging out this result. These console logs here, these result console logs, you should not touch these as you move through uh, this lab. These are how you're going to log out and make sure that you've got the correct things uh, that you're doing in this lab. So don't touch these console logs, please. Uh, Diana, you had a question. So am I creating a, a lab in a JS arrays, or is it already a lab there? Uh, inside of the, so you are, did you do this git clone already? Yeah. Perfect. So then you should have this JS arrays lab. Uh, and you can move into that directory and then, again, touch that uh, index.html file and open that in VS Code. This app.js file will already be here. Uh, this is, uh, you should already have that app.js file whenever you come to this. Uh, you'll have to create that index.html, though. So, um, give me a second. Yeah. Damn it. But I'm trying to. Get the terminal back up. It's not working. So CD into code SEI and then labs. Mm -hmm. 
and then copy to this git clone? Uh, yes, you should have that git clone. Uh, so you'll have git clone and then whatever the URL for your uh, repository is. Oh, shit. All right, I'll, I'll just come back if it doesn't work. Okay. We can get with you after this also, if you need additional help. Uh, so uh, again, exercise one has been completed for you. Exercise two is uh, giving you the instructions to add the strings pizza and cheeseburger to the foods array such that pizza comes before cheeseburger. Let's go ahead and just complete this one part of this, just so this is out of the way and done. How we would do this, anybody have any idea? Yes, Patrick. Yes. Oh. Uh, you could unshift it. I love it. So foods.unshift. And then what do I want to do here? Uh, you would put... Uh, pizza, comma, cheeseburger. Cool. Very good. All right. So we'll see after that. I should have in my terminal back in uh, my browser the result for exercise two. And for this, we see that we have indeed added pizza and cheeseburger to this array such that pizza comes before cheeseburger. So we've completed an exercise uh, and we can confirm that we've gotten the correct thing because over here in Notion, we have the answer key all set up for you. So you can confirm that you're doing the correct thing along the way. Uh, I should say, I think I might have deleted that. All right, so uh, here you could see exercise one result, we expect that to be an empty array. Exercise two result, we expect it to be pizza cheeseburger, just like that. So we have the correct thing, we've confirmed it. This is a great time for us to do an add, commit, and push. And there are instructions for this in the lab as well. So we can see here in our instructions, practice making frequent commits and pushes to GitHub as you work. General rule of thumb is to add, commit, and push with every new feature that you implement into a project. In this case, each exercise is considered a feature. So we can add, commit, and push by using the below commands terminal, make sure we're in that JS arrays lab directory. So here we can see, here's the commands that we should be using. Git add dot, git commit. And I want to replace this with a meaningful commit message such as complete exercise two. After we've done that, we can do a git push origin main. And now we've pushed up to our GitHub. You'll recall, we can check what our origin is with git remote dash v. We'll see we have our origin here, just like this. So, I can swing over to my GitHub. Do a quick uh, refresh over here. That's not what I want. There we go. So over here, if I do a refresh, what I should see in GitHub on my JS Arrays lab is I have completed exercise two.
Now, say I've completed this lab, I'm ready to turn it in. What I can do with this is copy this URL, this github.com, uh, wherever this repo is, and copy that. And I can take it over to Clippy. So in here, in Clippy, select deliverables. And then in here, we'll have the JS Arrays Lab. Yours will look slightly different from this over on the right side, but you can paste your link in here and then submit it that way. And that is how you complete this lab. Again, there are a total of uh, 15 exercises through this. Uh, and if you are good and do not have any questions, you're free to go. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Laters. Have Thank a you. good night. You, you too, have a good night. Questions, night. Mary, what you got? How did you get the terminal to pull up in VS Code? Ah, what a wonderful question. Uh, so for that, you're going to hit Control Backtick, no matter what your OS is. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Alex. I cannot hear you. Are you guys going to add the, the deliverable to Clippy later? Or I can't uh, find it, it on here. It should be in there right now. Do a refresh for me. We might have just added it in there. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. Oscar. The, you guys, that, that's literally the question that I had. It wasn't coming up. I just refreshed it. It came up now. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Kayana. Um, can you re-explain after uh, the push to get what you do after that? Yeah. Uh, so after you push to get, you should be able to uh, go to that page uh, on your GitHub. So if you navigate to your repositories on GitHub, you should see this JS Arrays Lab. And in here, you should see that your most recent commit has been sent to GitHub. So after you have that uh, and you're sure you're hooked up, you can copy this URL you've got right up here at the top uh, in your address bar. And you can take that and send it over to uh, Clippy. So that's just going to be on ga-clippy.com. Uh, you're going to swing over into deliverables and then you'll select JS Arrays Lab. Uh, yours will look a little bit different than mine here, but you should have a place where you can submit a link. So do we do that after the very first push or does it have to be like the last one after we're done? You could do that right now. Um, I, that's kind of what I would recommend. Just do it while we're all here and while you know you have the link handy. Um, we won't grade it until it's actually due. Uh, so we won't actually look at it until after the due date. Uh, so you have from now until uh, Friday morning to work on that lab. Cool. Uh, Will. Yeah, I I had a quick question. I'm on exercise mm -hmm. eight um, mm -hmm. for the lab, and I'm getting four instead of three. I'm not quite sure why. Cool. Um, uh, exercise eight. Exercise why don't, eight. Why don't we solve safe questions like that for lab review tomorrow? Oh, that sounds okay. good to me. Yeah. I'm cool with that. <laughs> Uh, or TA hours tonight. Uh, that yeah. would be another great place for that. Okay. I'll be here in like 30 minutes or so. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. Justin. It won't let me clone the app or the actual or at lab. Okay, cool. Um, hold one second for me. I'll come back to you if you're cool. Yep. Uh, Justin, let's, let's break out. I'll start. 
pulling people into breakout rooms. We need help. Cool. Thanks, Hunter. Up in room Ryan. Room. Um, for the for the frequent commits, do you want us to commit like every exercise that we do, or do you? prefer it would be a good habit to get into um realistically right now i'm not going to ding you for anything um but once you get into project week and once we start doing projects that's when it starts to matter a little bit more it helps to get into that habit now uh that will be beneficial to you in the long run uh but for this kind of exercise realistically if you as long as you get your work done you're good uh we're not like commits are not a requirement of this okay cool thank you so yeah good thing to be thinking okay. about but if you happen to forget it's not the end of the world <laughs> just hope okay. you don't get me grading it because i'm very strict on it frequent commits <laughs> a lot of commit <laughs> uh kind um i see that after uh sending in the deliverable it says there's an option to update would there be any reason to update no, the only reason you would want to is if maybe you changed repos for some reason, uh, but you really typically won't need to do that at all. Megan. Hey, so in my terminal, when I try to push to GitHub, mm -hmm. it's telling me that the command is not found. Ah, cool. Uh, can I see your screen? Yeah. You need to stop sharing, Dave. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. Um, you. Sorry. You're cool. You're missing Git. You need Git push origin main. Git push origin main. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, I see it. Cool. Thank you. Of course, Mariah. I think I did this all wrong. Um, so um, in the lecture support, Hunter said to just um, like clone it from my own existing fork. Mm -hmm. um, but since I already did this way back when, um, so I kind of like did the whole thing where I just, I just copied the link from my fork that I had. Okay. Um, and it like came up something weird on my um i might have you break out with uh somebody if uh joe or ian you don't mind doing that or jurgen yeah i'll um joe you want to help me out with it too Just... thanks for that thanks guys let's go to room. A room any room two let's go to room two perfect uh miguel uh so ben messaged me about the tic tac toe and I completed my pre-work about three or four months ago, and I can't find it. Should I work on it tonight, finish it? Um, let me... Um, how about... Let me get with you... Uh, actually, Ian, you mind... Do you do you know where to find that Ian by chance? Uh which thing? The um the rock, paper, scissors. Um I can maybe find where out it's of the pre-work. Okay. I have the link. What Miguel? Sorry. I I have the link for it. Oh, oh you have the link for it? Yeah, well I have the G A uh pre-work one. Okay, just, cool, cool, cool. I just don't have okay. the link. On, uh, code pen. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you mind breaking out with Ian real quick? I bet you all can work on that together and figure it out. I'll swing over there at a second, Ian. If yeah, you, uh, uh, let's go there. to uh, room three. Thanks, guys. Oscar. Uh, just a quick question. So the, the, lab, the lab that's going to be reviewed tomorrow mm -hmm. at three, that's this lab that's due friday um i believe that is correct let me double check i am not super looped in on tomorrow yet um javascript uh lab review will be first thing in the morning 8 a.m 
central yeah, 9 a.m eastern so but it's but this same lab is not due until the following day correct yes on on clippy okay yep yep and then uh as far as um because i've already started practicing just pushing uh committing and pushing to mm -hmm. to get and just naming everything every time i update like update something right or i i, I commit is it going to create another file under or is it just gonna is it just going to replace the like is this going to add like a replacement is that what it is it'll be a replacement essentially up on github okay cool cool all right that's, a, that's all i need perfect You guys good? Hey, David, I just had a question on uh, just a little bit on a few of them. I don't know if there's someone else too, or whether whether you'd like to just check it out. I'll check it out real quick. Why not? Sorry, say that again. My audio sucks. Oh, you're cool. I'll check it out. Okay. I get this weird uh, 